right. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, happy new year to all and welcome to another episode of Rise Urban Nation. We got a special event today. I got, you know, my Rise business partner and our advisor here. We want to really talk about DEI and CSR strategies for 2020. Before we get into this, you know, because uh, we've had some very rich discussion and dialogue, I want to, you know, uh, I'm going to introduce the group. Uh, we got uh, Jasmine here and Ade Sola, better known as Shola for all of you guys who've watched us throughout the year and when she's given us her business takes and key key points. And, um, you know, you know where I want to start at? I want to start with... Cause I gotta, and and let me frame this before I, I I give it to the the folks here. Last year I got to participate um, in Sherm, which is Sherm for those people who don't know is um, like the HR management HR managers platform for all HR professionals out there, and they they do several con- conferences throughout the year, right? The one I attended it was strictly dedicated towards. Um, uh, ED, DEI and uh, CSR, and it's called the Inclusion uh, Conference. And so this was the second year I've, I have attended, and you know they gave some great takeaways um, for the year and highlighted some amazing companies and work that was done. And um, there was a, a statement, and this is a statement that I'm gonna take with me um, as we go into the new year. Um, and I continue to progress in doing this work. And and the statement of the quote was, diversity is about head count. Inclusion is about making heads count. What are you doing in your company to make sure that heads actually count? Um, and they gave uh, great examples of this, like City of Austin had training, uh, training felons for public works programs. They had community job fairs and hiring fairs to at underserved communities and they they hired 600 people on the same day same day job offerings upscaling their workforce with certificate training programs they had job coaches and job placement assistants uh, at the city of austin so shout out good big shout out to the city of austin is just doing amazing things just to make sure that heads count they also uh, there's some companies there that did equity analysis and we'll get into some of this today in our episode and when you're doing the equity analysis in your company, where are the gaps you need to grow? Where are you at in your culture at your company? These are some of those important things. That's what really resonated with me. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Jasmine and, and Shola because I know you also have your own thing. So let, let's start with uh, Shola. What, what, what's, what's one that you would you would say to open us up today? Well, um, as you both know, I'm big on um, conscious capitalism, but something that you guys probably didn't know is that it only kicked in um, properly last year, you know, uh, for for me personally and for our organization, because, you know, within the fabric of our organization was to help our community, right, you know, with hygiene and tech. However, being conscious about it meant not only being on the business side, but also on the consumer side as well. We also realized that, you know, by taking that kind of direction, it actually would mean that we'll connect to, you know, Gen Z and millennials, basically, because they're like literally driving the economy now. So I, I want to share an article, um, you know, according to an article in Populo, um, it's clear, like, why corporate social responsibility is important to organization. It enhances public trust. It makes an organization a more attractive prospect for employees, particularly millennials. It leads to more engaged employees. And let's let's not forget that engaging in in corporate social responsibility and becoming a responsible business can help um, have a positive impact on an organization's bottom line. And, you know, Terrell, that's Mm -hmm. like my gig, you know, like, (laughs) you know, it's really hard sometimes when you think about making profit and also doing good and making, uh, you know, positive impact in the world. However, you know, we have found and, you know, I'm proving that you can weave this into your company's DNA. You can make this part of your business model. It is a marketable thing to look at. And it's something that will generate the right kind of profit. Um, So that's like something I'm really, really excited about sharing more on in this uh, episode. I'm going to pass it on to Jasmine so she can bring her 
lovely gems into the conversation. Yes, thank you, Terrell. Thank you, Shola. I just want to piggyback on the millennials part of it, the employee goodwill. So as you alluded to, although CSR helps with the brand recognition and just the external factors of what a company is doing, from an internal standpoint, as you mentioned, millennials are the generation that particularly are more motivated by goodwill and making a positive difference in the world than a professional recognition. Um, I have an article from my MBA class. It was Managing HR and Global Resources. Shout out to Indiana University. But the article (laughs) was by Dan Riley. And it um, says that right now employee well-being is still considered a cost, but it should be considered a company's greatest uh, investment. So as we've heard so many times from a variety of CEOs, employees are the most valuable asset, but now employee and uh, employee goodwill should be considered an investment. And I'll speak to my experience as an employee at a large Fortune 50 company. We do have a way where employees can do volunteer hours as part of what they charge to their normal, um, you know, working session. So I think we get about 10 hours a year to do volunteer work. And I think it's great that they allow us to do that. And I know that a lot of other companies are doing that. And there's something to be said about being able to go to your place of work, but also affect positive change. That is a key motivator to a lot of Um, one, a lot of millennials, but just overall, that is the new, um, money, so to speak. That is something that is trending and it's not necessarily going to be a trend. I think it's just the way that companies are doing business now. So, um, everybody wants to wake up and feel like they're doing something positive. And if companies allow their employees to have more of ability to do that without doing that extra work by themselves. They can just sign up on their company platform or whatever it looks like and just be able to volunteer for a nonprofit or whatever, the better that the employee is going to feel wanting to, you know, stay at that organization or feel as though they're at a good place. Ooh, I love that. I love that. And we're going to dive deeper into this conversation because, you know, welcome to the conversation. We're just getting started. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna do some introductions. So he's like, "Who, who are these people? Why should we take <laughs> advice from them?" <laughs> uh, for those of you who just joining us, my name is Terrell Simmons. I'm the host of Rise Urban Nation, the podcast. But we're we're more than just a podcast. We we also have a little boutique that helps you with your di- equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives, and your CSR strategies. And I know some people are like, "Well, what is CSR?" We're gonna get into that in just a moment. After we do the introductions, a uh, little background knowledge on Terrell Simmons. Uh, before I got into this work and doing this podcast, I, I did workforce development for several years, creating different programs for underserved communities, working with the mayor's office here at San Diego uh, to San Diego Workforce Partnership and so on. Um, and then now managing several just D before DEI or EDI, whichever acronym you want to use became popular. I was already doing it um, through workforce development initiatives uh, um, and different CSR strategies. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Jasmine to do a little introduction on herself and then we'll go to Shola. Yes, my name is Jasmine Floor. I have been a previous guest on this podcast, so thank you for allowing me to be back with you and Shola this time. Um, no, thank you for coming on to being an, an advisor to the run team, you know, and if you haven't checked out Jasmine's episode, make sure you go back to season one and check it out now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, so Born and raised from Flint, Michigan, been in San Diego for four years now, Uh, background in aerospace engineering, currently working at Collins Aerospace Business Unit of Raytheon Technologies as a uh, principal project development, a project engineer working on business development. So working on a lot of technology strategy, the latest and greatest cutting edge type of things, which is awesome. Um, been in the industry for six years. And within that time frame, I started an organization called Greater Than Tech. 
that is a nonprofit all about um, teaching girls of color the intersectionality of engineering and business. And I've been doing that for about two years now. So um, just grateful to be able to merge my love of technology and be able to give that knowledge to underserved communities. And um, I've also been very instrumental in employee resource groups from um, Collins Aerospace as well. So I definitely have been an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion and CSR um, as I've been able to partner with Collins Aerospace for my nonprofit program, Grow Me Strong. So um, very interested and love talking about this type of stuff. This is kind of like my uh, Will House of favorite things to discuss. <laughs> there, uh, and uh, wait, is, are you talking when you say Michigan? Are you a Michigan Wolverine football fan? I am uh, the Michigan Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly home, but I always ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I, 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 I'm glad you're still standing with your chest after you know Georgia you know what, gave you out of business. <laughs> We didn't expect to get this far, so I'm. Um, we all we care about oh is being a We did that, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, all right, Shola, you jump on in here, give the people a little bit knowledge of who you are. Okay, hi. Well, everyone, I'm Madisola Kindele. Um, you all know me as a global citizen, um, born in the UK, raised in Nigeria as well. Um, went to school and uni in the UK and built businesses across three continents. Um, I'm currently the CEO of High, High Gear Technologies. I am a partner at Rise Over Nation. Um, you also know me as a co-host that works behind the scenes, uh, assisting our team in making our brand look right and making our present known on the well across the globe. Mm -hmm. Well, my role basically is to help organizations build CSR into their business models as a pathway to profit. This will foster conscious capitalism as far as I'm concerned and um, attract a growing number of conscious consumers, especially millennials and Gen Z, um, and help them become the driving force of the economy. It's something that I'm really passionate about because I've been in entrepreneurship for a very long time um, and something that I've done as part of the way I mentor other entrepreneurs is to make sure they think about their impact in the world I love it I love it so so now let, let's let's dive into what is CD when we say CSR or EDI or DI what is that so I know Jasmine you had some experience with your current company with helping out on CSR initiatives so um, in your in your humble opinion what is CSR yes so CSR to me is a company's commitment to affecting positive change in a variety of ways. So, com so companies do that by um, working on natural disaster type of initiatives. Some companies work on serving underserved communities. Some people do that by, you know, food bank and um, that type of stuff. So anything that's social impact or doing good. CSR is a way for companies who have budgets and um, commitments to want to be that company that can impact a lot of people. That is what CSR is from my humble opinion. And luckily I've been able to um, see that firsthand at Collins Aerospace. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, no, don't drop that in there and then oh. give them a give them a brief example of <laughs> okay. how you was able to do that in that college okay, girl space. About that a little bit later. <laughs> no, okay. So um, example of that. So me starting greater than tech. Um, uh, I did a program called Girl Me Drone, and it was all about introducing girls to drones, uh, and you know, just showing them how drone technology can be used for their careers, or you know potential inventions, things like that, just giving them that exposure. And these are students who haven't necessarily been exposed to STEM or hands-on technology. So um, being able to have Collins part, um, sponsor that program was a enormous benefit to not only the students, but um, Collins as a whole, just because that was a time where, or that was a particular program where Collins hasn't necessarily been in that particular community. So this was a program held in Southeast San Diego. Um, we had underserved girls, so predominantly girls of color in that program. And um, we were at the Jackie Robinson YMCA, and I was able to leverage mm -hmm. um, Collins Aerospace, my coworkers, and they came to Jackie Robinson YMCA, and they were volunteers and mentors to the girls. So um, this was something where I'm, 
almost merging two different worlds or being this catalyst where people who haven't necessarily been in this community can and people who are of that community can interact with other people. So they're seeing and working with professional engineers and people in the industry and starting those connections. And um, I can speak from my own experience as someone who has done STEM programs as a kid where I've had um, a company sponsor me to do a summer program. And I'll never forget that company's name. It was Delphi. And I went to Kettering University uh, for a summer, for like four weeks in the summer. And just to think that how impactful that small token of, you know, um, uh, experience like that from a big company really changed my life. So being able to um, orchestrate something like that with my employer, my employer and my nonprofit firsthand, I know one day those girls are going to remember Collins Aerospace and think about them when they're, you know, on their STEM journey. So it's really a win-win for both sides and being able to um, be a catalyst for those communities to interact is really just um, kind of a dream come true. Yeah, yeah. And and <clears throat> me and you have had several conversations offline about that. And I'm just thrilled that your company w- was able to do this and you were able to do this because, like you said, that exposure is so, 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 so important. A lot of times individuals in uh, different diverse communities do- not even aware of these career opportunities. And that first exposure could be the catalyst to inspire them to, you know, want to start a career. And then eventually go back to work for that company because that company gave them the exposure and they see somebody that looks like you in that career pathway. I don't know how many students I've talked to throughout Southeast San Diego and all over the world. When they see me speak, they're like, there's somebody of (laughs) color doing like HR D and I like, maybe, maybe you're the only one. No, there's other people too. And then just that could be the game changer, right? Because if they don't have a parent in their household that does that, Mm -hmm. and it's not a, doesn't know about it they're not going to get the exposure right and so i I love love that that and that's just the first step of really investing back yeah that could have big dividends and returns on your organization right absolutely Um, not just the feel good yeah so yeah thank you terrell and just kind of even speaking to it being feel good but being um low effort so to speak for on collins aerospace i mean that was a you know a small token so to speak from their point of view, but just the impact that they were able to provide. Um, all those girls were able mm-hmm. to um, take those drones home and just have that exposure and that experience for the first time. So mm-hmm. I just feel like there's so much more that can be done, but just even that, you know, little bit went a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the same thing for when you look at uh, um, when we look at DEI, right, or EDI, whichever people always ask me, well, is it EDI or DEI? Like, it depends on the company, you know, <laughs> which way they put the acronyms at that point in time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, But when you look at just to give everybody a a definition of what DEI is, it really stands for diversity, equity, inclusion. And in a nutshell, it's a term to that is used to describe policies and programs that promote uh, the representation and participation of different groups of individuals, including people of different ages, races, ethnicities, abilities, disabilities, genders, religions, cultures and sexual orientation. And sometimes when you do a good CSR strategy, sometimes it'll have elements of DEI in it and, and you could you could hit on both. Now there's another side to this that we 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 often overlook or um sometimes isn't integrated and that's ESG. And I'll let Shola talk to the ESG. Shola, what's ESG? Yeah, you know me. <laughs> you know you know, <laughs> you know I'll cover the the money front, huh? <laughs> well um <laughs> ESG basically stands for environmental, social, and um, and gov- governance, and it, it's an umbrella basically uh, for sustainable and responsible finance co- components. So it, basically, it's a framework now being used, you know, for investment to flow into companies, and this is massive because you know including something like this in the decision-making process of whether we're going to, you know, a, a organization or financial institution is going to invest in your company is major. In fact, there, there are instances where people could potentially lose um, investment or funding because they're not actually taking, you know, ESG, DEI and OCSR um, 
seriously now i know these are like three acronyms are throwing around but they all are interrelated in essence so you know dei is a big big part of esg you know it means that it's a non-financial factor that really affects the bottom line of a company and dei is not something you know based on uh, terrell is going to explain this more it's not just about how good your brand looks or headcount it's about how inclusive that person feels and how good they feel working in your organization and because of the social movement that happened basically in 2020, it's really, really become a, a major um, highlight, not only for investors, but investors see that if a company actually works hard on its ES ESG goals, they're looking at things long term. They're looking at how they're going to offset their impact and basically use the sources better. So it's pretty important that we're talking about all these three things they're going to come up ESG not so much um, particularly in this uh, podcast but I just wanted to make sure I touch on it because it's really a factor now that could essentially affect even startups getting funding uh, in the future yeah absolutely and and we touched on an article before we came on this podcast um, by CNBC mm. that really brings all of this home and we talked about companies that are making big promises about greater diversity but there's such a long way to go um, you know some of the key points in this article um, that I'll put in the in um, the, the notes after this episode is you know with women and minorities still un underrepresented in leadership position companies have been announcing initiatives aiming at promoting promoting diversity even before the protests ignited George Floyd but we see we saw it amplified after the murder of George Floyd um, companies that fail to promote inclusive policies face a number of financial risks including inquiring and retaining employee talent um, I know something we've personally seen is that investors VCs new VC firms or banks or, or corporations you know backing startups or getting into business with different VCs if there's no diversity they're willing to walk away from the deals um, because they they now have a, a new positioning on where they stand with uh, equity and diversity um, additionally as ESG investing becomes increasingly popular companies that don't prioritize diversity could see investors ditch their stocks uh, and you see this in Wall Street as the new generation of millennials are more conscious about their capitalism. They want to invest in companies in the business of doing good. As Shola will often say, uh, we want to be in the business of doing good. And, and what does that look like as we, we continue to go forward? You know, you'll see much attention that's been given um, at the SP, like 500, Fortune 500 companies now have at least one woman on the board. Now, we still need to do more. Hmm. But uh, if you don't have at least one woman on your board at this point in time, then where have you been? You're stuck in the caveman area. No, no longer are we in the era where... Um, it's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, white men on the board making decisions. Uh, I, you know, there's a, um, an organization, a shout out to um, Leaders 2020, an uh, organization I was a part, well, still a part of. They gave me my first board training and uh, there was a slogan that they used where they said, you know, we're trying to um, promote more diversity in the boardroom by giving this boardroom trainings and working with companies to get more minorities on the board. Because what we see is the current leadership in the boardroom is, is male, stale, white, and pale. So let's add some flavor in there. <laughs> and this is a white man that said this. It wasn't me. It, you know, I'm just only don't shoot the messenger. That's this is what the one of my the training facilitators who happened to be a white male said. And the, he had me at he had me at the hello when he even said that. I was like, okay, all right, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a oh there's a gosh. lot to do when it comes to minorities that are being underrepresented in every aspect of business venture capitalism um and and you know i want to start off with the funding in the vc space so look could you give us mm -hmm. you know a, a breakdown of what that looks like when you look at the landscape yes i'll be very happy to so obviously you know there's this big push as you both know on having diverse uh venture capital uh capital or well, capitalists basically so you have the structure of how vc works is you know you got, you have the lps basically they're the ones that put money into the fund and then you have the managers they're the ones that manage the fund so there's a structure there however you know it doesn't stop at just plugging money into um a venture capital um, organization that is structured with black people 
It also involves the companies you invest in as well and the structures. Because the thing is, if you're really trying to change the economic landscape, you know, and have DI be a massive, have massive impact, it can just be a situation where you are giving money to a group of people and usually the checks are lower. If you've noticed, the funds are small, much smaller. Then they're writing smaller checks to companies that potentially have high growth. Now, a high growth company needs bigger checks. So now there's added pressure on the VC now for pushing the next round, which sometimes some organizations are not even ready for. You know, revenue doesn't become a focus anymore. It becomes funding rounds. Now, this is not something that's sustainable. We've seen this consistently in companies that basically exit, you know, before they should, before they even make any kind of impact or companies being bought out so that diverse startup companies where, you know, possibly has a company started by a black woman would end up being bought up by one of these bigger companies that all have diversity issues. So, you know, it's very important that we have VCs not only look at number one, where they're getting their money from, but criteria that involve them investing in companies that would ensure that they're startups that have DEI as part of their fabric, which means commitments from, from um, founders that half of their, half of their team is going to be women or the other half is going to be, you know, LG, um, well, a uh, percentage will be LGBTQ, you know, and a uh, percentage will be, you know, people with, um, abilities and things like that. So, so all these matter all these things matter because if we keep looking at DEI on the surface, that's all it's ever going to be. Now, when it comes to um, startups like founders, founders should start thinking about how do I wrap this into my business model, right? How do I make CSR and DEI part of my business model? Because the thing is, there's a reason, okay, I'll give it a clear example. There's a reason why femtech is shooting up. That is an industry completely dominated by women. These are things that women have literally been saying that need to, you know, get developed products, services that need to get developed for women that, you know, again, the people with the, with the cash, holding the cash, people within the organizations that, that um, give uh, funding are predominantly male. So they can understand our issue. That is a massive thing with diversity. Diversity allows you to have someone on the table that would help you see the opportunities in a particular audience. And that's something that's really, really important. It's not, again, about headcount. So bringing someone on board into your organization that looks different from you would also share how your organization could impact that particular community. I can understand why organizations, uh, like, you know, bigger corporates don't see this. You know, nonprofits have been ringing the alarm bells for a while. And these are community, um, they're community initiatives that are available that you can essentially plug in. So these are like kind of things we need to look at. Now, one of the key things about CSR. CSR, you know, holds businesses accountable for social commitments in a quantitative quali qualitative manner. ESG helps measure or quantify such social efforts, right? And that is what investors are now looking at, right? They're looking at those markets. So um, EDI um, is essentially part of the, the bucket and so is CSR. So if you really want to really make uh, your, um, for instance, on the VC side, your portfolio look good, you need to be looking at what your ESG metrics are in, in your part. Same thing with LPs. If you're planning on giving um, uh, VCs or, or putting money into a fund, you know, create criteria for investing in startups. Like, you know, say, well, that if I, if I don't see at least 30% of the board are women or 40%, you don't make those. I mean, the thing is, look, we will not have an economy without people who plug money in. Money is needed. Funding is needed, right? If you're making this criteria and I'm like, look, I'm going to look better to you if I'm pitching a company that has this ESG goals or EDI goals or CSR goals. And it's, you know, so now it's, it's like, where else can you make more money? You've already made more money in a particular set of people, right? Now you already have this massive opportunity with a whole group, another population populace, right? That you've just completely ignored and you can build profit by focusing on, ele um, elevating this, uh, different groups of people who have been shut out, who have been underrepresented. And that's something that's majorly important. So that's what we're trying to, to say here that, you know, it's important to think about how, what your dollar, how your dollar affects the, you know, decision making, how it affects a particular group of people or groups of people, uh, and how it can potentially help the planet, you know, be, uh, how I put it healthier in the long run. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's a study too, that not only 
you know, sheds light on this from a, a diversity and inclusion standpoint. Um, I can't think of the name of the company off the top of my head, uh, but I think it's McMillan that talks about how not only is when you have that diversity, it, it makes for better bottom line and profits. It makes for better innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're more change ready, more agile. Um, and and it, it just makes it just makes better sense. Like if, if, if the true goal is to to if you're talking from a capitalistic standpoint to 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 make a better product and service that'll make more money and, and be to the masses is only smart to include more diversity and, and look for those gaps triple bottom now, line we're you know mm -hmm. there you what go. is it yeah People, triple bottom, bottom line, line. yeah and the <laughs> There you go. Boom. All right. So so with that being said, Jasmine, what do you see as far as untapped potential? Yes. So there are so many articles about this. Um, in my mind, untapped potential normally is in relation to underserved communities. So um, there's one article I see from MSNBC about why 50 percent of multicultural women in corporate America are intending on leaving. And a lot of that has to do with a, a couple factors. So um, one is that, well, one thing to note is on this article, it says that um, multicultural women, women are highly ambitious, with 25% more likely to aspire to senior roles than white women, but 63% of early career multicultural women hope to make it to the top. Only 40% 41% of late career multicultural women have the same aspirations. So to me, that is saying they have the drive and the ambition, but they're not seeing themselves get to those positions. And um, contributors to that are that implicit bias. Um, I mean, explicit bias, hopefully um, that's not mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot, but basically just not being heard, not being seen, their ideas not necessarily being, um, you know, given, like their ideas not being heard by senior leadership or them getting the credit for it and seeing something that they want to do actually make it to a uh, part of the business. So um, that to me is one of those issues where these women are in these rooms, but they're not necessarily getting the support they need to take things to the next level. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is kind of this ongoing cycle of if you know you have, if you, if you know you want to make it to the top, but you feel like there's not a path, I understand why 50% of women um, want to leave, especially in tech. And um, overall, I mean, it, it's just one of those type of things where it's like, the, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> where if you don't see the people in the boardroom <laughs> or the C-suite that represent you and um, being mindful of this type of situation or this issue where every employee isn't heard and valued, then it's going to be this perpetual thing where, you know, when is it ever going to end? And Terrell, I'm sure you can speak to that as well, just from a board member standpoint and a C-suite and executives um, being representative of those leaders that are really making those commitments and decisions for DEI and really taking um, heed to it. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And, and I mean, when we look and we, we further examine and we look at the landscape, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. And, and so for this next one, let's just have an open discussion about when we look at the landscape, what do we see? You know, I, I know we went through articles, we've worked with companies ourselves, uh, you know, and, and I'll let each one of you pick on something that you, you kind of see. Let's start with companies that are in trouble. Who's Ooh. in trouble when you look at the landscape? Who's in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> not, not the not, not, not the not the tale or call them out, but what do you see? Who's in trouble? <laughs> yeah. Well, Tesla is one of them. You know, there was a recent case where they had they have been ordered to pay one hundred and thirty six point seven million. You know, for rate for a racism case. And when you look at it, you have to ask, like, what kind of experiences do people of color um, or any marginalized group um, go through when they're working in in an organization like that? And you know, I like essentially what you look at is when something like this happens, what the company does is they, they look for something they can do to, you know, basically 
ginger, you know, put a, make a positive impact in that community, right, that has been affected. But that's not actually happening. It's been a couple of, um, you know, I think over a month now since this happened. And um, nothing has really come from from their management on how they're going to be, you know, support, you know, or do something that has that would b basically bring a positive spin on what has happened. So that's one of the companies that I would, you know, highlight uh, off the bat. Um, and it would be nice to see them have some kind of corporate social uh, strategy or goals set up with initiatives in the community, um, possibly something DI related that would create like, you know, really great pathways for, you know, people of color to, to come into their company. So things like this would not yeah. happen. Um, yeah, an, another one, and I'm not sure if this is as big as Tesla in terms of, well, lawsuit and things like that, but recently listened to a podcast, um, Arlen Hamilton's Your First Million. She had a um, person on there just speak about um, how to break into tech and something that Google was caught doing or at least called out on. So um, Google made a commitment to hire more women into engineering. But what was happening is that Google was hiring more women into engineering, but the managers who were hiring them weren't necessarily promoting those women um, to further roles. So mm. they were getting these bonus or some type of incentives to hire the women to get them there. But as the women were in those roles, they never actually progressed. And it was almost like, you know, we, we were giving attaboys to get them here, but then not necessarily taking it to the next step. Yeah. So they were called out on that. And I'm pretty sure there's um, a follow-up yeah. to it. I just haven't went through it specifically, but just... Well, they're under, yeah, they're under investigation ah, right now well. for the treatment of Black women <laughs> workers. <Yeah. laughs> you know, so, that's, uh, so I guess Alan was onto something there, you know. I mean, like California civil rights regulator, mm -hmm. and this is according to NBC News, by the way, um, is investigating Google's treatment of Black women, uh, female workers, following alleged incidents of, this is harassment and discrimination, according to two people familiar mm -hmm. with, with the matter and emails. Mm -hmm. You know, had you know, we always say, you know, always have paper trail from agencies seen by Reuters, apparently. So they're um, basically attorneys and analysis, analysis at California Department of Fair Employment and Housing um, have repeatedly interviewed several black women. Right. So they're basically on the investigating at the moment for something that, you know, they supposedly had a way to fix earlier, but it was just like a bad yeah. There you have uh, it. Again. Yeah. And, 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 and. <laughs> And, and and I don't want to <laughs> isolate this as just a Google problem because this is a, a problem that's yeah. all across the tech industry. That it's a very male, uh, macho, machismo, mm. you know, defined culture, um, and mm. it, it's something that uh, it's going to be a forever. It, it, that's why that's why we call it, you know DNI CSR uh, a marathon. It's not a sprint. There's not one sh size fits all, yeah. and it's something that you're going to constantly have to work on um, to create a culture that is inclusive to all the different um, individuals that are needed to progress the industry, or else you're going to stay stagnant or find yourself into all these legality troubles. Like something that we just see off the top for a company like this is if they had some type of mentorship program at every level one just to go into the community so they can understand the needs of that community when they go into the high schools the colleges and they start to incorporate that and strategies that help that and then once people get in you know mentorship uh matching that allows for um advancement and leadership and some policies and programming around that that helps streamline it so it creates the right culture for somebody coming in because what's going to happen is even as they bring these people in they're not going to want to stay nobody's going to stay in in the treatment that gives uh -huh. them mm -hmm. you know mental health issues and and stress and so forth like uh -huh. i might as well go to another company or go out on my own if i if if this right. is how i'm going to be treated right um, and, and it's, and it's mm. only so much money you can throw at a problem before people finally say, you know what, the money's and not worth maybe it. Maybe <laughs> we should speak a little bit about um, like the difference between being reactive and proactive because I feel like <laughs> Ooh, <we don't. laughs> I feel like these <laughs> are examples of being reactive to DEI, social impact, yes. um, and I mean, are there any good news stories that we can talk about that are proactive i mean i feel like it's more it's money better yeah, spent yeah. if you just go ahead and do what you need to do and what the company 
says that they stand for. Look, look, I'm we're sorry, I'm over here just... taking over my interview. Like, <laughs> we, we, that's what we about to go into. No, so, so let, let since you brought it up, let's talk about that. <laughs> Who's doing a great job in the business of doing good? Let's let's talk about it. Like, I mean, I know for me, I got several examples, and you know, one of those examples oh. is band aids, right? Band aids. Uh, for those who don't know, they just released the the different flesh tone band aids last year, and this was a project that was originally in their pipeline years ago, but they got strapped for whatever reasons, right? And it wasn't to actually. I might have to give a shout out to True. Uh, True Color, I think it's called True Color Skin Tone Bandages, because they were the ones who mm -hmm. really launched first, and then Band-Aid came first. aboard. Now, the Band-Aids mm -hmm. was at the Inclusion 2020 conference that Stern put together, or, yeah, no, 2022 conference, uh, no, 2021 Inclusion conference that I went to last year, and they, 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 they told the backstory to this. And they they talked about the psychological and mental aspect of of healing, not just from a physical at standpoint of having a bandage that is finally in in your skin tone. What it does in that racial dynamic that we've had so many years, and, and it took for us to come uh, create a bandage. On my flight, incoincidentally, I, I on my flight home from the conference, I remember sitting next to. Um, a white gentleman uh, who grew up in a, a predominantly white neighborhood, and Milam had a, 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 a really good organic conversation. And he was he was asking me where I came from. We talked about the inclusion conference, and uh, and then I don't know how we got on topic, but we <laughs> talked about you know the bandit story. He's like, oh, so what's something you learned about it? Like I feel because we had we were he was talking about his 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 lens because he worked at a university in which he sees D&I and I and I talked about my lens and I told the bandage story and he's like you know what I'm going to tell you something because I feel comfortable with telling you this he's like I went um earlier this year I went to the store and I I I, I had had to get a bandage because you know my daughter or somebody in his family had hurt themselves right and he had to go get bandages and he went and he went to the bandage section and all he saw was these bandages that were from a, a different color tone like the, the darker tone and he was so confused as what was this and why was this and where was the the bandages that he was accustomed to seeing in his flesh tone and he was so upset about it and then he couldn't believe like there was no bandages in his skin tone he was and he was so upset about it and he went home to talk about as told his kid like i can't believe this like i don't even know why they have this and then he's had the aha moment and he's like oh my goodness it just occurred to me <laughs> that why they they had these you know bandages and darker skin tones and all these years i, I never thought twice about it and he felt so embarrassed and, and his kid and he, he told his kids did you know about this and one of them did and the other one didn't uh, and they had this beautiful conversation about diversity and inclusion from it and, and thinking about for like, you know, the past 40 years of his life, how like people from that community has just never been noticed and we never yeah, even I thought never twice, thought about, twice it, right? about it, honestly. I love so. that. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, I did. <laughs> so I always only buy like, um, I only buy, I used to only buy for Alex um, character um, plasters like that have like cartoons oh, yeah. or something on it. That's like where they leaned on to. Yeah. 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 So, and and yeah. The, the, the story <laughs> of the true color bandages of these fathers that got together along with that medical doctor who created that company and, and, you know, the feedback they received from creating these bandages and, and, and the, the storylines of all these people who like, finally I, I'm seeing, and finally this, you know, it, it was just a beautiful story that, started to unite the world right um and something that came out of the story from the financial part of it of and you know because another company that has done this is crayola too right um they they actually were deliberate they work with uh old mac scientists for mac uh the the beauty company to create all these different skin tones and different colors and um they they didn't do it originally for profit for, for profitability they did it for to be inclusive and really talk about you know race and, and so forth right um and but here's what happened they saw profitability from doing the right thing because what they realized that 
the black spending power is 1.7 trillion and once they broke those numbers down and they saw the increase in sales and then you they started doing the data behind this 10 percent of asians and other minorities marry outside of their race and who did they marry black people and so the so that that 1.7 trillion is just with black Sloan. So imagine what's going to happen as multicultural households start to get 10% of all these different races, mm -hmm. then it's going to extend that. So now you got a further extension of that, that buying power, right? Mm -hmm. So if, mm -hmm. if, if companies want to choose to ignore this and not recognize it, they will slowly lose business or be out of business in the next five to 10 years. And yeah. So if you want to just look at it from a business Agreed. standpoint and not look at it from the doing good standpoint. So, you know, these are the feel good stories yeah. I love. I don't know. Do, Shelly, do you have any that you want to share? Yeah, I want to share more, but I want to take it onto the uh, CSR side. I know, I know there's been heavy focus on DEI. I wanted to give examples on companies that are doing a good job. So we've got, I don't know if you guys have heard of Patagonia, the outdoors um, company. So if you, if you're big on outdoors, you, you probably know them. They actually dedicate like 1% of their sales to environmental organizations globally. You know, in fact, they recently accounted that 20 million had been donated already through customer con contributions to their Patagonian, um, action works. And this is something that I've been trying to explain that, you know, bringing these elements into your bottom line, make a massive difference. If they've been able to donate 20 million, you know, you can't imagine what they've made with that dedication of 1%, you know, of all sales. You know, another company um, that I like to highlight that most, most of you guys, maybe, well, we're all, okay, except for you, Jasmine, but we four eyes, Warby, um, Warby Parker, I don't know if I'm saying mm -hmm. it properly, but um, essentially, you know, they're a real example of solving real world experience, um, experience problem solving. So it's a situation where, you know, how their glasses are made um, is they're very transparent on how that is done. 15% um, of the world population lack access to glasses and they're doing something about that. So that's something that I like in terms of plugging in. Another one we all know is Ben and Jerry's and Terrell. I know you love, <laughs> I love Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> they was on the front line ben after and George Jerry's. Floyd. They got their arrested name. and everything. And they're their ice cream name. Out of prison, so. They were the phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I will exactly. forever buy exactly. that expensive ass ice cream because of all the good work they do for the incarcerated and, and, and work for the oh program. God, and they, they was just about that life. They got arrested. Yes. Their Black Lives Matter. Yes. Like, <laughs> front line. Exactly. Not just Black Lives Matter, bro. They're like broadly ranging. Uh, they have a broad range on advocacy, racial justice, democracy, re refugees, peace building, GMO labeling, fair trade climate action, LGBTQ equality, and RBGH. So there are so many things. And another company that I want to highlight more than anything is the Groove Collaborative. Now, I don't know if you guys know what a B Corp, B Corp is. I'll dig into that a little bit after this. But have you noticed that the Groove Collaborative already has sections now in Target? I don't know if you've gone um, shopping recently. They have like their own like stand and everything. And, you know, this is a one-stop shop for all things healthy, home, and personal care. What I really love about them is, you know, they have this massive goal to plant a million trees over like the next three years. Right. So um, they're big on environmental protection, you know, and they've also partnered with um, Arbor Day. Another company you might be aware of is Bombas. Um, Bombas, um, basically, they have a collective um, achievement of 10 million pairs of socks donated in the cause of Bombas. So if, if you I don't know if you know how Bombas essentially uh, works, you know, so basically for every sock you buy, you know, one is donated. And because that's because socks are the, um, largest, well, the biggest request in, uh, well, with ho in the homeless community. So homelessness is something that they focus on. And these are really good examples, um, that I like to give because it, they just remind you that these, I mean, these companies, you'd probably didn't know a lot about them years ago. Some of the companies like are doing pretty good, but just because they made a choice to make their business model um, something that has, you know, impact. It's basically helped their bottom line and they're fully, fully uh, transparent. So when I mentioned what a B Corp was, I wanted to just explain what that is. So these are certified social enterprises verified by B Lab, a nonprofit organization. Basically, certified companies um, on how they create value for non-shareholding 
stakeholders such as their employees, which is really important, as Jasmine has highlighted, the local community, which is really important, of course, and the environment. The environment is coming up consistently in conversations now, but you know, these are this is something, this is certification that organizations can essentially go after when they prove that they are actually doing what they're doing um, and um, the bottom line, uh, they're using their bottom line to impact some of these uh, social uh, causes. Yeah, you know, you know, um, going back to Target, I went into Target the other day and they have a black book mm-hmm. section and where they highlight Ooh. all these black authors. Yes. And I was like, what? And, and black style. I see you. And fashion too. Yeah. Fashion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, Target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you already had my business, but now you got you you got my loyalty. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, and you know what? They have a um uh, an accelerator track for black owned brands yeah. to go uh, to to basically um become suppliers in Target. I don't know if you've noticed in the beauty section as well that has massively grown uh, before any anyone else. Yeah. You know they were the ones that made uh, and I love that they have an accelerator because it's not just saying come and supply; it's teaching you how to grow your business so you will be able to sustainably supply. Mm. Another brand that um, in the beauty space um, is Fenty. Fenty basically in fifteen months of operation accumulated five hundred and seventy million dollars in mm. revenue, right? And that was because that's an inclusive brand that was a major major poll right and the thing is look if we if we keep ignoring it it's, it doesn't make sense a nielsen poll in 2018 showed that 85 percent of millennials and 80 percent of gen z rank like the environmental and social causes high on their list in deciding which companies they're going to engage mm. with so you can only imagine that the entire operation of uh, that uh, for rihanna for instance is worth like 2.8 billion but wow. of which 50 percent belongs to rihanna yeah. personally uh, look so this is not something like we can ring the bell uh, loud and everything. If profit is really what you care about, you can actually still make profit by doing the right yeah. thing. You can make profit by having a fully inclusive company and diverse uh, um, f- company, uh, f- fabric of a company is fully diverse. You can have you know profit and help the community at the same time by plugging in to initiatives and programs that are actually doing a good yeah. job. A lot of these initiatives die out because they don't have mm-hmm. funding. Meanwhile, you already have resources allocated or you've labeled resources like all these companies um, saying they have a $100 million fund or whatever. You've labeled resources. Meanwhile, even a 1% you know, of, of some of the, the funding you've allocated can do so much mm-hmm. good. You know, And this is, this is the kind of things that we're trying to figure out that why is it so difficult for companies to plug in? Why is it so difficult for companies to basically be accountable, show the receipts of what, you know, let's run the receipt, you know, of, of all these things that you're promising, mm-hmm. because it's not that hard. It's only hard because the companies are reflective of the mentalities of the people running them. And, and it's just being closed minded. Yeah. So that means if you don't know how to do it, it might be time for you to consider creating a pathway for diverse for a diverse workforce that will tell you how to mm-hmm. do it. And that's something why we feel that DEI is super important in how um, you know, corporate social responsibility is enacted, you know, globally, because you can actually help a problem if you haven't experienced it. You know, being talking to people who have experienced certain things makes such a big difference. Look at the the, plas- the plaster story, uh, the bandit story, sorry, that, that uh, Terrell just came up. This person had no clue for, for you know, in all his life that this was a problem for a particular community. Can you imagine if, like, I, when, I remember when I first saw True Colors, the first thing I thought, like, man, that's great yeah. money right there. You know, I always look at things in the financial sense. But, you know, but someone else who doesn't look like me looking at it got irritated. Yeah. And I just think, look at the profitable opportunity in that versus, you know, do you see what I mean? You know, looking at it on, uh, I, I I don't really know, some kind of internal, you know, uh, um, uh, how, 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 I don't know other way to put, describe it, but tribalistic kind of way of thinking, you know, that has flooded business, that has flooded systems. And that needs to change if this world, again, is going to. Oh, yeah. Move when for, you uh, said run the receipts, I know you have you some, some think, cool uh, stories too. Apple, they can run their <laughs> receipts. Um, they're a really good example <laughs> of a company that is developing that diverse pipeline and engineers and um, entrepreneurs. So, as part of their $100 million racial equity initiative, they developed the Detroit Apple Developers Academy. And although it's in partnership with Michigan State, they 
<laughs> they um, ah! they're enrolling people eighteen to sixty um, for a ten month program, comprehensive program where they can learn how to develop their own apps. And if you think about um, you know what who Detroit is, I mean Detroit is seventy five plus percent of black people you're essentially developing a ecosystem of black innovators who can solve black problems and black um you know just the things that are relevant to that community of people so not only is apple um doing the work training a a workforce but they're developing a whole new opportunity for new apps that could come from people of color, by people, um, for people of color, by people of color. So I just think, um, you know, this is really the beginning of something that we're going to see flourish in the next 10, five years where we're just going to gain so much more Mm. cultural um, products and apps that people like us will really enjoy and and solve problems that we have. So, um, yeah, I think this is a a great move on their part because, it is giving back. And this is a, f- a free program. I mean, 18 to 60, you don't have to have any experience, no cost, um, in wow. partnership with Michigan State and Rocket Lab or Rocket Mortgage. I mean, there are a few key Detroit um, entities or programs in this program, I mean, in this ecosystem right now. So I just feel like they're developing something that has never existed that is centered around Black culture. Yeah, I, I love I okay. love that. And and listen, uh, like she said, we, we want to see more of this and we want to highlight those companies. We want to talk about it and, and, and get best practices. Right. So in well, in in 2022, February, sometime around February, I'm going to put I'm going to put I'm going to just put it out there. I'm going to put ownership on myself. We're going to we at run. We're going to we're going to launch the run the receipts program. I, all y'all that made big promises, big commitments. We we, we want to see it. We, we, we're the receipts. It's been two years since George Floyd. I, I want to know what y'all doing out there. And look, for the, y'all who still struggling, we we here to help you. We got a whole slew of <laughs> services, amazing entrepreneurs, programs that we could connect you to to help you with your CSR, your, your EDI strategy. So and I just want to add for. on to that. Um, the two years, let me see. that where, is where the do we from, here? from the George Floyd um, murder. So... He's referring to all of these different yes. commitments and initiatives and things that these corporations and companies have said that they want to do. There is a very small percentage that have actually executed and created those plans. So um, Apple is one of them, but I, there, there's not a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. there's an article, I think it's less than 15% that have actually mm-hmm. done the work that they um, were intending to do. So to Terrell's point, there are some people that need to do some work, and right. we know how to help you. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, it's not just a PR stunt, because that's the problem. People has, have used CSR as a PR stunt when it actually is something that can help your bottom line and your ESG goals. So, right. you know, this is something that we want to see. And as Terrell has said, you know, just like how people uh, pull up for, for, for change is holding people accountable on, on diversity. We want to hold you accountable on the promises you made on, you know, helping the community uh, with all this money that you have thrown at it. And if you're stuck, there's lots of things that you can do uh, to help, which is we call, you can contact us directly and then let's have a chat and then let's see where you're having a problem and where you where how we can help you solve it, essentially. Yeah. So um, I wanted to, like, have us touch on success stories, too, you know, on our own personal front, because there's a reason why we all got together to to have this, uh, not only this conversation, but to see how we can be part of that um, progressive movement in getting things mm-hmm. done. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that uh, le- that's a, a great way to, to wrap it up, the segment in a nice, pretty little bow. You know, just, you know, and we kind of share, you know, how DI, CSR, ESC goals can, goals can help your company. Um, and, and, you know, just to show you some success stories from us, from our personal endeavors, you know, I know for, for me with D, DEI efforts, um, how we've seen it, it, you know, personally, how it could 
you know, a company came to me and said, you know, look, our funding is at risk because we we don't have, you know, you know, DI strategies in place. Um, and they also lost out on great employment from individuals who were seeking to be a part of the organization because they didn't focus on the correct DEI strategies for that for their organization. So I, I that is one one strategy that I have personally. Um, I know you, Shola, you have your own personal story when it comes to high mm-hmm. gear. So tell if you want to share your individual success with high gear. Yes. So um, you, you obviously, you know, that we're a hiding tech company and we had predominantly focused on giving access to UBC technology as a means for community, you know, to enhance community hygiene. But, you know, one of the, the issues we were having was plugging the, the products that were in the market to people. So what we decided to do was create a, 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 an initiative that would directly get the products in the hands of those who are at risk the most, especially with this global pandemic. That led to us actually starting a sponsor a teacher campaign. What we what we fast realized was that this was a way forward for us business model wise. So that meant we could now work with organizations, put together um, a, a funding, you know, public fund fundraising campaign for them because that was the biggest struggle. They couldn't have, a lot of organizations, schools, and whatever may not have the budgets to be able to purchase products that can help with air quality. So we found a way to basically wrap in what we do, what they need. And get the public to actually help directly to actually equip um, these uh, uh, um, spaces. So that for, for us, we saw that as a big win because automatically we now had our own um, uh, social responsibility uh, initiative already set up. It was directly going to get to, they're no longer consumers anymore. They're the people that actually need the, the, the technology. And the public is now involved in getting, get you know, helping getting this done because COVID is a community problem. Mm-hmm. And if, if if you're not seeing that or haven't seen that over the last uh, couple of years, you're, you're missing something. So that not only made us successful, but it also helped us go from pre-revenue to revenue. And that's something that I felt that, oh my goodness, this is a winner here. And if we can actually help more startups think of um, uh, CSR and DI in this particular manner, that we would be, I think the world would literally start revolving, you know, in a completely different way for the, for good. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I know Jasmine, she's she's had her own success stories as well with, uh, you know, GTT. Uh, did I say the acronyms right? Yeah, GTT. Great. Was it greater than? Yes. What's the acronyms again, Jasmine? <laughs> give me, if you could give me the acronyms. <laughs> yeah, greater than tech. Uh-oh, uh oh, hold on. She 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 got she got uh get her mic set up here. There we go. Boom. <laughs> hey. <laughs> did did you hear anything I said? <laughs> Do you want me to repeat it? <laughs> oh, you just want to mute again. Oh yeah, you just you just muted yourself again, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and you know what? While she's getting set up, you know one one company that I, I like. If you wanted to start small, because I, I remember you sending an article to me, um, Shola, not too long ago, at, where I, I I recommended you to you know be part of you know Tori Birch's campaign. Um, she did this uh, oh. campaign uh, in partnership with Upworthy um, called Empowered Women, and this is something that could be easily replicated with any di- diverse organization that you want to work with, like if you want to work with Run, we can set up a, a, a page just like this that Terry Birch did um, in partnership. And what she did was she was she highlighted inspiring women making an impact in their communities. And you can nominate these individuals and then these individuals receive $5,000 to give to a nonprofit of their choice through the Terry Birch Foundation. Um, and she just highlights these amazing women in their stories and then um and it's a it's an easy win-win right you're highlighting and you're supporting mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. your foundation arm of your organization if you have it or just directly through your organization and it's not it doesn't it doesn't cost too much work if you especially if you partner with the right organization like a run uh rise Urban Nation or yeah. or any other organization that's already in contact with that community and then you can start to build community with that 
organization. And guess what else will come out of that? You will have a pipeline to more talent. You have a pipeline mm. to success. You have a pipeline to innovation. Yeah. Um, companies yeah. who fail to innovate fail to thrive. And that's why you see sometimes some yes. companies get stagnant. So the only other way they can grow is to buy out other companies. But what if you could do that and also keep innovation within your pipeline by partnering with other organizations that have the same values as you um in diverse communities it would be such a a, a, yes. a win-win and there's so much we can do with that to just kind of move the needle and, and keep you know that pipeline going um i love that you highlighted highlight that terrell because a lot of people think oh they should only touch csr when they've made like when they become like a million dollar company or something like that you know and i think that 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 you know, based on the generation that is moving the economy, um, the needle of the economy now, which again, millennials, the decisions they're making to buy your product is based on what's going on behind the curtain. So it's, it's very important that you think like, Hey, hang on, man, whatever I'm going to do, even as an, like an, as an app, a tech company and all of that, you need to look at your carbon footprint. You need to look at, you know, how you're supporting different groups of people within your organization. You need to look at what social movements are you going to, to support? Because if you're not supporting any, you're, you're going to have a problem, right? You know, and it's like the, the Tory Burch is great because I like the way that it's not only about making impact, but impact that is going to help generations in the sense of providing loans for women. I mean, you know, if you, this is the thing. Feed a woman, you feed a generation because literally a woman is the one that holds the helm when it comes Ooh, to kids. It. So it, it's I like that. That is their client base that has made them a multimillion dollar brand. And they're now saying, you know what? We're going to give back because guess what? In the long run, that set of people would become people who decide I'm only buying a Tory Burch bag because or a shoe or whatever or clothes because you know what they helped me start my business or you know they helped me do this they helped me do that and that you can't buy that kind of PR you can't buy that kind of marketing that is just organic right there and it's it's the same thing even when you're you're trying to build yourself on social media people want to know who you are people want to know what's behind the curtain people want to know your story what has helped me the most you know more than anything is being authentic and sharing my story with mental illness and supporting mental um, health initiatives. You know, now in high gear, supporting women in tech. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I connected with Jasmine because in our in, in our space, in our in our in the, in the in the sector that we're in, we struggle to find women. We struggle to find women to work with that are that are um, available. And think about it: if there's only a, a, a small percentage of women in the pool in life sciences, they will already be busy you can't pull them out it has to be worth their while to pull them out to come work for you and that does, just doesn't make sense you know the lack of encouragement and the lack of diversity in multiple spaces is actually harming sectors more than doing good because you cannot imagine the viewpoint that uh, somebody different from yourself will bring to the table and the other thing is that even when someone that's different from you brings something to the table you do not give them the recognition that needs to stop as well because you're not encouraging them to keep bringing up, be, keep being innovative. Like innovation should be rewarded. It is rewarded when you have an IP and when you, you are able to, to, to sell it off or license it. There's more to that within an organization. This is something, the topic that actually came up in one of the events that we were, uh, you know, were sat as a panel where when an employee donates the bottom line of a company way past what they were employed to do, how is an organization rewarding that set employee and these are things that really really matter so like you know coming coming around again on 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 uh, our own thoughts about the success of us, us personally jasmine i really like you to uh, you know to discuss like how gtt created this like vehicle that you know organizations essentially can plug into based on whatever it is that the organization does in tech that would allow to, you know, that would inspire another a, a generation of women to uh, that would eventually create some kind of pathway in the future that would make, divert, you know, make um, more opportunities for organizations to hire more diverse uh, uh, professionals. Yeah, and, and, and make sure you tell them what GTT is because, you know, sometimes we throw a whole bunch of acronyms, yeah. people thinking we, think we know they, what the acronyms are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> GTT is short for Greater Than Tech. 
And um, the vehicle that Shola is referring to is um, basically building a program around a company's technology or their um, brand, so to speak. So I mentioned Girl Meets Drone a little bit earlier and in my last podcast with Terrell, but um, Girl Meets Drone was a really great example of how we were able to leverage a large aerospace company um, as our premier sponsor and create a program based on something that is in their, you know, aviation space. So drones, Collins Aerospace, Aerospace Company. But the idea is we could do this for any tech company that has some type of emerging tech or, um, you know, just some type of technology that we can build hands-on programming around. And that allows us to give underserved students just visibility to what these big companies actually do. Um, And there's just so much in technology coming out. I mean, AI is one of the biggest ones, but, you know, we can work with AI SaaS companies that um, have something that they want to be able to maybe even enhance through kids' ideas. So we want to be able to make this something like a incubator or, you know, just allow kids to have that hands-on exposure with large companies and um, see benefit from not only the social impact side, but, you know, maybe even a profitability side. So um, we're creating the structure around all these key technologies. And I hope that um, any tech industry leaders um, that hear this will want to partner with us and be able to allow their employees to work with some underserved students and then also just get their name brand out and just do good for people who may not have the resources and the ability to, you know, have this hands on tech experience. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, I try to keep the, I know we could probably talk about this forever, but I want to try to keep it in a nice, concise manner so that <laughs> people that are on the episode for two hours try to get all the information. <laughs> and so I want us to end off with some, uh, you know, some key statements and call to action. So, you know, I'm going to go back to my key opening statement, which was, you know, look, diversity is about headcount. Inclusion is about making headcounts. So what are you doing, like the city of Austin, to really, you know, make heads count? Are you Have you done the equity analysis? Where are the gaps that we need to grow within your organization? Where are we at in the culture? These are questions that you should be asking yourself within the organization. And if and if you haven't asked yourself these questions or you need help with it, reach out to us. You know, we are a collaborative consultancy on the mission to help you improve company culture within and externally and internally. We'll do this by helping, you know, VCs invest in corporate consciousness um, and companies do good for all. We help startups build social responsibility into their revenue streams with employees on improving their DI metrics, which is something that should be done from day one and is often looked as an oversight to later on after the companies grow. Um, that's my my key message and takeaway and I hope, hope you hear heard me loud and clear. Uh, Shola, what's yours? What What's something that you want to end off with? Yeah, so, you know, the thing is, is to, uh, and, and this is just piggyback of what Terrell had just said, it needs to be thought, it should be thought of from day one, and it's okay even, ha- even if it hasn't been, you can build short, medium, and long-term programs to help you achieve your CSR goals, you know, with heavy emphasis on DEI, which will eventually improve your ESG goals. So if, if funding is something that your company heavily relies on, you need to know that that landscape is changing. It's going to become a requirement to see what kind of impact you're making on this in this world, in your community and in communities that are underserved um, and that's how investors will make decisions to see how what kind of stamina you're going to have um, you know in doing business so that's something that you know I think like you know will be the major call to action so if you're looking for something short term that will lead to a medium term um, initiative and eventually a long term program you know such as what Tory Burke has, has put to, um, put together and all some of the other companies that we mentioned you know uh, today you know we are be very happy to, to point you and help you uh, get this done absolutely Jasmine what's yours yeah I'll just um, leave with the idea that employees want to do good they want to make positive change and we have a way for your employees to do that we want your companies to um, reach out to us if you want to plan a CSR event 
a tech event, be able to um, provide and do goodwill. Um, I believe millennials are the largest workforce right now. Mm. And um, this is a demographic that is all about the social impact. So um, going back to that original statement that employees are a company's largest asset, um, this is a great way to just keep your employees engaged, happy and motivated. Yeah, yeah. And even if you're a tech company, I don't care how much tech you have at the end of the day, uh, you know, you're still in the people business because the people help create that tech and help make that manage and, and maintain that tech. So um, you're still in the people business at the end of the day. And look, here's the close out with this. Let's close out with this. There is a more than enough opportunity to buy from companies who prioritize human rights, social initiatives, community development, and health, a healthy planet with each dollar you spend. And as you c- continue to see the wave of this new millennials as they enter the workforce, this is a priority of theirs. And this is very important to them. So if you don't start to shift and recognize that change that is coming, you're going to be left off and it's going to be too late to incorporate because they've already seen your true colors and they, they in this culture of cancel culture they're quick to cancel uh, a company that that isn't about that life so let's let's help you with your strategies and um help you get into the business of doing good because it's it, it, it it's not only is it good for the economy and good for human rights it's it's just good business and if it doesn't make dollars it doesn't make sense so let's make sense of your strategies in 2022 with that being said we are out and thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in the new year happy new year everybody happy new year happy new year bye everyone